Hello and welcome to the Business Channel in association with SIBSI, the Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineers. Today we're looking at refurbishing and retrofitting workspaces. We'll be speaking to leading players including the global market-leading environmental technologies manufacturer Mitsubishi Electric, the designer and manufacturer of low-energy lighting products JCC Lighting, Flacked Woods, a leading supplier of air technology-based solutions, Gratt Brothers, one of the UK's leading independently owned building services companies, and Camfil Farr, world leader in the development and production of air filters and clean air solutions. The UK aims to lead the move towards a low carbon economy, which is necessary because of both climate change and rising fuel prices. Reducing the carbon emissions of buildings will go a long way towards meeting the UK target of an 80% carbon reduction by 2050. So what are the solutions and how effective are they? Forty-six percent of UK carbon emissions come from our buildings and of that probably two-thirds is from homes and one-third is from office buildings. And one of the biggest contributors to that is the lighting that we use in our buildings and what we call the appliances, the photocopiers, the computers, the coffee makers, um, the machines that we plug in around the building. Uh, and they, they, they're responsible for a significant proportion of energy use in buildings. But in the older, less efficient buildings, we can use a lot of energy heating them and heating the surrounding area because um, they're leaky, uh, they're not well insulated, and a lot of the heat gets out of the building. Lighting is a really, really significant part of the energy consumption of a building. It's, it's probably the most major one, and it's certainly the most easily influenced. Uh, changing the heating environment and the insulation is quite, quite a difficult one to do, but lighting you can change very quickly and have an immediate impact. The sky tiles we're using here, um, immediately you put them in, they have a 60% reduction over the traditional fluorescent tubes. That's a significant saving. But if you start to put controls in, so you switch the lights on and off automatically, that has another saving. Because with fluorescence, it, it's much more difficult to do that. LED lights can be switched off immediately. You can get another 30% saving out of that. We're now at a situation in the UK where we need to quite rapidly, probably over the next 10 years, move away from a reliance on fossil fuels and move towards renewable options. So highlighting the two renewable options for us as being heat pumps that recover renewable heat from naturally occurring places and PV that generates power from the sun. So for us, applying those technologies to buildings means that the building itself can become lower carbon by definition because its direct emissions are lower because it's not burning fossil fuels on site. It's very difficult to quantify exactly because buildings have different potential. Some of course are currently in a far, far worse condition than others. Um, but uh, improvements in energy performance usually come about as a result of three things. Uh, fabric improvements, upgrading and new systems and products, but also I think user culture and how the occupants actually handle their building. But we as contractors can make a significant difference. Um, I have in fact recently completed a project where the saving was, was just in excess of 50%. So there's a significant potential for, for many buildings and many clients. Well, in the low carbon and retrofit market, Canfield provide quite a lot of products and services. The basic business mantra of our, of our business is that we provide the best quality air whilst minimising energy consumption. Any commercial building where you've got a fan moving air, we're the company that would filter the air so the inhabitants of the building are, are breathing clean air. Our products have a huge impact upon the energy we use in the marketplace. Typically we could change the, the, the filters that are in situ currently in many, many buildings, replace them with low energy alternatives and save between 30 and 50 percent of the energy use that the filter would consume within that air handling unit. Relating to our own products, we're more akin to mechanical products which from the different legislations that are occurring today, the ERP developments that are occurring has meant that we've had to look quite closely at electric components such as electrical motors. For instance, back in June of last year, what ended up happening was that 
the standard electric motor moved away to becoming a specialised motor called the IE2 electric motor, which has a massive impact in carbon reduction and efficiency. In fact, this has actually reduced the energy consumption by over 30%. Coupled to this, our main driver, which is our axle fan, we've had to develop the efficiency factors from, say, 75% to over 90% to meet the carbon reduction emission programs. The other point that is occurring with industry is that there's this link towards uh, carbon reduction. So energy recovery units for buildings, particularly in schools, have been very, very important. Energy recovery units now can give you as upwards of 90% energy recovery. So we're quite fortunate that we have developed lots of these different products to actually meet the demands the way legislation is taking industry and business particularly. We've worked with many companies across, across all sectors. A good example is WJ Aldis, who are a furniture retailer. They looked at uh, upgrading their lighting in both their stores and also in their warehouse. They invested £81,000 using one of our loans and they're saving £41,000 a year in electricity costs. Innovative businesses are leading the way in pioneering technologies that could dramatically reduce carbon emissions. But how will these lead to the way our buildings look in five to ten years' time? The competition for energy, the international competition, is just going to get greater and greater, and therefore the cost of energy is only going to increase. Um, I think the way we, we light, the way we heat our, our buildings is really, really important, and therefore the way we think about them. It's not just the lighting, though. it's how you lay the lighting out and how you provide natural light into the building. It has a real impact on the way people behave. And I think that the light, that the workspace will change significantly. I mean, the use of LED and the fact that it's much closer to natural light will mean that the, that the pressure to be next to the window will actually change because actually you get just as good light in the middle of a building. What's happening is there's this massive development now towards controls and sensors. The very point you mentioned that you go into a building, the lights will be turned on or turned off, the heating comes on and comes off, and therefore the sensors and the controls are very important. We've actually seen a lot of this in terms of the car park business. What's happened in the old days, a lot of ducted system in car parks were actually installed. Today, they're now working towards a jet fan system which is controlled through the management building control system, CO2 detectors, uh, smoke detectors. These are far more efficient and they're in a situation that it actually allows the fire brigade to get to the seat of the fire quicker, which in turn will reduce the CO2 emissions that are occurring from the fire. So that there are major changes that are occurring and, and our role is to help educate people towards the new products that are available in today's market. I think in five to ten years' time there'll be, a, there'll be a, a few more buildings which will be covered by all the, uh, the Paratel regulations uh, put out through Europe and the, the European Parliament Building Directive. But fundamentally, in five to ten years' time, the buildings, the existing stock, are going to have to be retrofitted. And there's a lot of them, there are 60,000 buildings in the UK uh, that, that require air conditioning inspections. So, personally, I feel that we need to engage with a much wider audience, a much wider uh, lobbying group to get these initiatives moving quickly. So in five, ten years time it's up to us, we've got to work hard, we've got to get, we've got to get these retrofits into, into play and if, if they don't happen then I'm afraid we're not going to move much further forward. In ten years time how we produce buildings will have to have changed drastically from where we are today. And I think we need to look at them in two separate areas. Those are the buildings that are yet to come along, the new built arena, and also the buildings that exist today. So new buildings obviously will have to be better than the old buildings. And they, that will be driven by legislation and it will be driven by what people actually expect. They expect new things to be better than the old things. So they will be you know, leaner, greener buildings in the future than they are today. And that is a good thing. But the big target ahead of us is how we address those emissions, that energy use in our existing building stock. We call it a building stock challenge because it really is. We have 26 million existing homes in this country, something just short of 2 million existing commercial buildings. We would say that changing some easy changes such as increasing insulation levels has got to be done first. 
drive down your need for energy, but then look at how you are consuming energy in that building. So use a heat pump rather than a gas boiler, for example, generate your own power with PV panels. That will give you some level of energy independence from the grid and see us on that journey towards you know, a better building stock in the future. So the transition to a low carbon world will change the way that buildings look, feel and are used in the future. But in the present we must also address the huge number of high carbon emitting buildings currently in use. And for these, are retrofits and refurbs the most realistic option? Retrofit is really important because uh, most of the buildings that we see in the UK today are still going to be standing in 2050 and buildings are uh, huge uh, gas guzzlers of energy and we need to reduce that energy use right across the building stock. So it's really important that we tackle that uh, both for uh, environmental reasons uh, but also for economic reasons to save money on our energy bills. But that's more than uh, a problem, it's actually an opportunity because of course if we are successful in reducing that energy use we'll not only uh, reduce energy bills for the people uh, working in those buildings but we'll also create a huge retrofit market that could employ tens if not even hundreds of thousands of people uh, in that new emerging market. Fortunately for us in the UK we live in an environment which is very, very good for delivery of renewable options. The perfect climate for technologies such as heat pumps to gain that low grade heat from the natural environments, upgrade it and deliver it into buildings. We can also have an awful lot of acreage of south facing roofs in this country. We can put PV panels on those. Now, yes, these are more expensive than, the, than they were before and they have to really be done in conjunction with driving down your energy demand. It would be folly to put a more expensive technology on a building if you haven't done as much as you can to lower your need for energy in the first place. But work together properly. Low and zero carbon options such as heat pumps have a big part to play. Well, I, I would always say that there is potential in refurbs and retrofits, but not just to save carbon. I think that uh, it is an expensive way of going about it if in every other respect the building is fine. It works, I think, when as part of a refurbishment you take the opportunity to upgrade um, systems and products. Um, this works actually fairly well in the commercial sector because most buildings either have changes for some reason within a five or ten year life and that's the time when there's going to be changes to introduce um, new products I mean, lighting is a perfect example um, where you can make huge benefits and huge savings just by refurbishing the lighting. But you wouldn't just change lighting for lighting's sake. But if you were refreshing a building, that's the time to do it. It's really about what they want to achieve. In the old days, contractors and consultants would have supplied the product into the building and then it become the actual service manager's responsibility to service that. What's happening now our clients, their clients, are seeing the benefits of actually either refurbishing their buildings or effectively ensuring that new buildings to the new BREAM legislation, for instance, meets these demands. So you can't say that any sort of um, building is, is right for one sort of application. Due to the uh, need to control costs in, in the current recession, um, uh, climate. Uh, we are seeing that more people are opting for the retrofit model to be able to enjoy the benefits um, of LED lighting in terms of delivering 60% um, plus energy savings from their electricity bills for lighting, which is a significant part of the overall cost of running a, a building. And we are seeing that this uh, retrofit option and the solutions that we as a company are bringing to the market really embrace the need to consider the ease of installation to avoid interrupting the natural flow of a business and to minimise the impact. I think we're in this cycle of refurb and retrofit for a long time and let's look at it, you know, we can, we can do a retrofit which is fairly low cost, it's not capital intensive, 
Um, very, 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 very low impact, good carbon impact, and it'll greatly extend the life of the buildings. So we can get more out of the existing building stock and also save energy as well. So refurb and retrofit do seem to be the best approaches for cutting carbon emissions in the existing building stock, especially when money is tight. But what do organisations need to consider when thinking about making this change? I would recommend you start with doing a post-occupancy evaluation. It's called post-occupancy because it's something that was typically done after a new building was occupied. But what it does is establish what people think of the building, what they like about it, what they dislike about it. And that gives you a thing you can then use to set a brief for a project manager. And if you do that, then you have a proper plan about when it's going to happen. You'll be moving towards the point where people enjoy your building more and you're reducing the energy use. Now, reducing the energy use saves money. Making people enjoy the building saves even more, probably by a factor of 10. Which is huge which is huge and is achievable and can be done through refurbishment. In broad terms, the first thing you must do is observe some sort of energy hierarchy, we would argue. So reduce your need for energy, insulate your building where you can. Now, for our building, our headquarters building in Hatfield, that wasn't possible. We occupy the building. We occupy it over a lot of hours. It is a busy working building. We didn't have the opportunity with the way the building was constructed to close it down, strip it down, and re-insulate certain areas. So we went straight to phase two, which is see how we can change the energy need that we have to use to supply heating, cooling, and power to our building. How could we do that differently? So we changed from gas boilers to heat pumps, both air source and ground source heat pumps. We recover heat from areas that we're cooling and we use it in other areas. A good example is we call our canteen when people are in the canteen, but we use the heat absorbed to generate hot water for the kitchens to wash up afterwards so we don't waste that heat. Then we've looked at renewable options. So we've put renewable energy in through our ground and air source heat pumps, but also through renewable power with PV panels on the roof. So taking an ordered approach, an energy hierarchy, would be the best tip that I could give. You should never do refurbishment just to save energy. It should be part of another program. Uh, that, that, that really, really pays back. You should certainly look at fabric improvements first, seal the building, make sure that the heat losses and, uh, and general energy use is reduced as much as possible. Then you look at the engineering services and measures. If it's an occupied building, it's absolutely essential to take the occupants with you. Share with them the plans, how they'll be involved, what the results might be, and perhaps even more importantly, what the aspirations are for the building. Get buy-in from the occupants. The products that we make are clean air, so get a product that actually does what it says, clean the air. Um, there's a, there, is, there is new legislation upon us come out of the European uh, norms, EN 779-2012, which actually makes people buy the right product that actually does the job, it actually cleans the air. Secondly, get one that actually is a low carbon alternative, get a low energy air filter. Get one that's actually going to create you the biggest impact on your energy bill as well. Those two combinations, low energy air filter, the air filter at the, at the, that actually does the job properly, I would say that should be the specification that you would, I would advise to anybody. If people are worried about the cost of LED as opposed to traditional lighting solutions such as perhaps fluorescent where you can clearly see the difference in lighting quality, if customers would like to see how that works then why not trial or do a pilot in one particular work area, or one particular office or room, such as Marussia have done here um, in the modelling room. And here you then can appreciate the real improvement in lighting quality. The closer um, the lighting is to natural daylight um, in a room like this that doesn't have any natural daylight, this has been very well received by Marussia Formula One. 
it's important that you have good advice. So uh, it is worth getting a competent engineer uh, who understands what you want to do and understands the options that are available. The client's got to be engaged in the process and be prepared to make decisions along the way uh, and may sometimes need to change the plan uh, when you discover that something in the building is not as you expect. So I would say from a client perspective, you need high level engagement. Somebody has to wake up in the morning thinking about the refurbishment project to make sure that it's, it's going to go smoothly and you don't pick up nasty surprises. People do need to think about their budget and generally you save more energy uh, per pound with the cheaper, simpler options than, than going straight to renewables. And although the feed-in tariff has been cut, it does still provide people with a subsidy for photovoltaics. So there are subsidies available. And indeed, in some planning areas, uh, a major building refurbishment may find that the planners insist on an element of, of renewables. So knowing that uh, things like the feed-in tariff and the renewable heat incentive are available uh, becomes quite important if you're being pushed into renewables uh, by other policies. The government is doing its bit to kick-start the cutting of carbon in the workplace, but how effective are the carbon reduction commitment, the Green Deal and the renewable heat incentive? And should the government in fact be doing more? The Carbon Reduction Commitment um, was a very good start. It certainly made major energy users really think about what they're using, account for it. But what has happened to date is in creating the first league tables, the complexity of the scheme is making it very, very difficult to roll that out through other users. The Green Deal, um, as I suggested, is a good one should be supported, but the complexity of rolling that out across the country with all the vast range of uh, energy improvement measures to not only an appropriate standard and quality, but one that actually benefits the occupier is a real challenge. The RHI is a far safer bet in that it does give a guaranteed payback for all the heat that's generated from um, renewable heat equipment uh, and measured. But what's happened recently with the FITs and the somewhat premature and messy way in which government have made the changes, I think is going to have a very negative effect on not only businesses but many occupiers in deciding is this a route they want to go down. With regards to the built environment, government know, as everyone else does if they look at the figures, that the buildings that we live and work and play in are the biggest contributors towards emissions in the country. It's bigger than transport, bigger than any other sector. So there's a lot of stick and carrot in that whole built environment going on. So CRC, you could argue, Carbon Reduction Commitment um, Energy Efficiency Scheme, you could argue is a stick. That is driving big energy users, big companies, to realise the value of the carbon that they're consuming in their buildings, putting a value on that, Therefore, making sure that they understand that if they lower that, their exposure to the costs are going to reduce as well. But renewable heat incentive and maybe Green Deal, I think you could argue is more carrot. That's trying to encourage people to do things differently to the way they did them before. Well, there's already been a lot of action on lighting. Um, we've already seen both the 100 watt and 60 watt incandescent bulb be um, uh, removed from the marketplace, certainly from a manufacturing perspective. And that legislation is going to continue to tighten the belt in terms of finally getting rid of some very um, inefficient lighting and to act as the stick to ensure that we're moving ahead with our commitments both um, as employers, um, as industry and as a country. We, however, see now that the momentum is really picking up pace. I think before it's been a necessary uh, change that people have, have adopted in the face of this, these legislative changes. But now we see with the improved technology of LED, 
the price is coming down and in the same period the price of energy escalating um, in particular that that is really now um, helping people to see the benefits of LED lighting as a commercial uh, opportunity and as an opportunity to control their costs. I think the real thing about um, government incentives is that they need to be consistent. I mean the government can play a role in this effort of trying to decarbonise but we really have to set long-term targets which they stick to. If they back off at this first sign of difficulty then nobody will believe they actually mean it and if they and they've been doing that I mean they've done it for various different reasons I mean the feed-in tariff was probably set too high because it was a phenomenally good investment it was actually therefore driving all the wrong things and so people would be putting in photovoltaics instead of trying to save energy on their buildings when you get things like the display energy certificates in buildings not being followed through into the private sector that's a terrible shame because it saved an awful lot of money in the public sector. The UK Green Building Council would probably argue that there aren't really enough incentives at the moment in place uh, for either um, landlords or tenants to reduce their energy usage uh, for retrofit to take place. Um, but what we should really be looking for is, is less uh, lots of uh, sort of tweaks and, 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 and small measures and really just consistency uh, and a really clear landscape uh, so that landlords can understand what they should be providing, uh, when they should be uh, upgrading their uh, office or workplace uh, and, and, and what they should, should really be expected of them. And that, that sort of clarity of policy landscape will be what provides confidence uh, for, for uh, uh, landlords to invest and that will be what really creates the market here. I would say they could, they could first of all, put uh, less capital intensive products and, and equipment on the energy technology list. I think that would greatly enhance and improve our own productivity, but also it would save a lot of energy. We think the government are doing some good things. They're taking a lead on environmental matters in our view. The renewable heat incentive, for example, is a world's first in that area. They've also set very long term quite stringent emission reduction targets, 80% emission reductions by 2050. So they're to be applauded for that in our view. Big event for me is partnership programs between all the actual uh, companies and the businesses that are related to buildings and carbon reduction. The manufacturers, for instance, have a wealth of experience that can be actually shared with the designers, with the architects and the governments towards what is best for that building. I actually wonder whether we're actually at a time when what may be possible is to launch a campaign about the way we use our energy and our attitudes to it. The reality is, if we don't reduce our energy significantly over the next five years, we're either going to struggle to satisfy the demand or the cost of supplying it will be excessive and out the reach of many. So neither of those options are very attractive. And I think if the government worked on a bit of a long-term drip-drip approach to say we need to change our culture to a culture that says wasting energy is bad, I would like to think that was better than trying to legislate. So the government is doing its part, and its ambitious target to reduce carbon is encouraging organisations to both tackle climate change and reduce energy use. Refurb and retrofit are both key in changing the way that we work and live, and they also have the potential to create thousands of new jobs with the emergence of this new market. Well, if you'd like to know more about any of the organisations that we featured today, then check out our website, thebusinesschannel.tv. Bye-bye for now.